us each day. When we bow before the Lord, his statutes to obey, he promises to hear, he promises to heal, and he promises to bless and to forgive. If my people Open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 7, and verse 14, a very familiar verse to many people. Many, many sermons, I suppose, have been preached on this holiday weekend using this particular text. But we'll try a different one. As you find that, in honor of God's word, please stand. And we'll read verse 14, and if you will read along with me, we'll read together. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, 
Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Please join us as we look to the Lord. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you today, first of all, thankful that we live in the country that we live in, and yet concerned because too many have turned from you. And though we call it a Christian nation, we recognize that Christian principles are not being followed. Most are not truly Christians, and this land needs a true revival. You gave us the answers here in this verse. So help us to pick up on that thought and let it begin individually with us. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. If there is any hope for America, as we look around at what's going on and we see the unrest and the trials and the problems that take place, that hope is God. Unless America turns back to God, we probably are going to get worse. As a matter of fact, some of you are old enough to remember when the nation in general looked to God and when they began to push God out of government, push God out of schools, push God out of main places in society, the nation began to change. It's not what it was when we were younger, is it? It is totally different. If you had have told me when I was uh, just graduating from high school that America would be the way it is today, I would have said, you are absolutely crazy. But it is. So we need to see what God has to say about a remedy. We sing God Bless America, but it seems that most Americans have really forsaken God. He's no longer welcome in our schools and places of society. He's despised by many in authority. He is scoffed at, laughed at by many. But in reality, without them knowing and understanding, he is the only answer to the calamities that we see in America today. Our hope lies in getting back to God. So in our text, we see some words that maybe we need to focus on just a little bit. The first section of words that we see are if we are God's people. He says, if my people... If my people. Now, I will add to that just a little bit. If we are God's people. He is not talking to the world in general in this text. He's talking to the, uh, the people of Israel. And he's saying, if my people will change. Those who belong to me will change. Now, every person that is born into this world is a creation of God. They are an offspring of his creation. But the population, as the population of the world continues to increase, not all are God's people in the spiritual sense. Those who receive Christ, the scripture tells us, we're given the authority to be called the sons of of God in John chapter 1. So not everybody recognizes God. A few people actually hate him. Others, and that's a majority of people, reject him. Reject receiving him as their savior. Reject trusting him and putting their faith in him to have their sins forgiven. A great majority, sadly to say, simply ignore him. They don't listen to what he has to say. They have no time for him in their lives. And so they go their own direction. 
only those who have been born again have a relationship with God as a child to his father. Those of us who have been born again understand that principle. We like to think everybody's a child of God. As I said, everybody is an offspring of his creation, but not everybody has a father-son relationship with him. Listen to what Jesus said. He's answering a group of Jews who claimed a special kinship with God. In other words, kind of like uh, we hear today, well, we're all children of God. We're all his children. Well, they claimed that they were, but here's how Jesus answered them. In John chapter 8, verse 42 through 44, he said, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of the, your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Now, he's speaking to some religious people here, some people uh, who claim to be children of God. And he's talking about them, but they hated him and they sought to kill him. And so Jesus tells them, if God were your father as you claim, you would love me. That's an interesting statement, isn't it? You know, if we claim that we have a heavenly father, then we must love the Lord Jesus Christ. For he is his son who he sent to die on the cross for the sins of the world. Every person needs to be born again to have their sins forgiven. Every person needs to be born again to have a home in heaven. Every person needs to be born again to have a father-son relationship with the heavenly father. There's a vast difference between true people of God and other people. God's people have trusted in someone other than themselves. God's people seek God's glory rather than their own. God's people are serving God, not Satan. You see, there is no neutral ground in this. Some people think there is an in-between. Even some think there's an in-between heaven and hell but it's not in any Bible. There is no purgatory. You either, when you die, you're either with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven or you're in hell. There's no in between. So, Jesus said it this way. He that is not with me is against me. He didn't leave a neutral ground there. So, there's folks that say, well, you know, I, I, I'm... I know that there are some that really love the Lord and are Christians and are faithful, and some of us just sit on the fringe. We're in the middle. We don't hate God. We just don't do anything. But there is no middle ground. Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. If we're not serving him, we're against him. If we don't love him, we're against him. If we don't walk with him, we are against him. You see, God's people are all headed in a different direction. All men come into the world the same way, don't we? But all must then make a decision whether to follow Christ or to go their own way. Proverbs 14 and verse 12 says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. Do we see things as God sees it? Or do we see things the way we want to see it? 
every now and then I, in witnessing to someone, they say uh, to me, or talking about a, a different uh, problem or situation, they'll say to me, well, the way I see it. You know, it really doesn't matter how I see it, and it doesn't matter how you see it. It does matter how God sees it. That's the big thing. So, if my people, and I said, if we are his people, if we are Christians, if we are called by his name, if my people, which are called by my name, is the text, but I want to change it just a little bit and say, if we are called by his name. Now, what name would that be? Anybody? Come on, it's not that difficult. Christians. All right, a name that we have today that I carry with pride. I'm sure uh, that it is a, a symbol to the world that I am a child of Christ. But it was a name that was given to us in Antioch to make fun of them. And the idea here was uh, that these Christians, they're Christ-like. They're imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were making fun of them because of their stand for the right things. It's not always the popular, the popular thing today to be a Christian and take a biblical stand. It can, believe me, from experience uh, and dealing with some things in the area, uh, I can tell you, you'll make some enemies if you just say the right things. If you'll take the right stands. You will have some people stand against you. But we need to be right. It means to be Christ-like. It means if I'm called a Christian that I must and should always try to live up to the name that I have. Alexander the Great found that one of his soldiers carried the name Alexander. But this soldier had proven to be a coward. And he didn't like that. And he called the man to appear before him. And he instructed him either to live up to the name Alexander or to change the name. I want to submit to you that we need to start living up to the name Christian. We need to act like we are children of God, Christ-like in our behavior and our attitudes toward others. We bear the name of Christ. The world expects more of us than it does others. It's just expected. I remember once when my, uh, my son was in, I think, the fifth grade in elementary school and Unlike his father, he wasn't always the best kid. And so he'd gotten in some trouble. And the teacher told him, well, your dad is a preacher. You shouldn't ever do things like what you did. Well, he's a human being. He is a kid. We understand that. But that teacher expected more of him simply because his dad at that time was a youth pastor. Well, the fact is, the world expects more of us. I can tell you that if we do not do the right things, I'll get it thrown up in my face that there's a member of my church by some unsaved person that are no different than I am. It's happened many times over the ministry. People expect us to be different. And we should be because Jesus Christ changes us. We become a new creature in Christ Jesus. We should be different than everybody else out there. So we must be careful how we live, how we act, what we say, where we go. Those things are all important. If we are God's people called by his name, here's what we must do. According to this text, 
if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. The first thing is that we need to humble ourselves. That's not an easy thing for the average American. It's not an easy thing for the average person because we like to think that we are self-sustaining, that we are special in ourselves. We're proud. We're boastful. Our technology in America is, is advanced. Our standard of living is the highest and our luxuries are out of this world. And for us to humble ourselves seems to be a problem. But to humble ourselves means to confess our sins to God and to admit, to admit that there is nothing good within us and we can do nothing without him. Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 11, he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Well, it's the time maybe that God's people humbled themselves and spent a little bit more time in prayer for this nation, for the church, for souls to be saved, for things to, to happen the way God wants them to go. The second thing he said here, if uh, my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves, and he said, and pray. We are to pray. I wonder if maybe most of us or many of us have forgotten that God still answers prayer. You want to find out how much people believe in prayer? Call a prayer meeting today and see how many come to your meeting. It's funny, isn't it? People who are dependent upon God don't have the time to call upon God will not take the time. But God's still there and he still answers prayer. But so many of God's people are backslidden. They're so far out of touch with God that they don't pray. Or they don't have time to pray and do not believe in prayer. But prayer means that we have an approach to God. It means we have an appeal to God. It means we have an expectation from God. And it means that we'll get an appropriation from God. What should we pray about? We should pray that God would reveal our needs to us so that we can confess them. That God would reveal our sins against him to us so that we can repent. That God would forgive us and cleanse us. Well, he says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. We must seek God's face. The only thing that hides God's face from us is sin. God calls those who are without Christ. He says, look unto me and be saved in Isaiah chapter 45. We should behold the face of God. And when we do, we will see the one who is powerful enough to supply every need. If we want God's blessings and if we expect God's blessings, we must look away from everything else and seek his face. Look away from the things of this world and seek God's face. Look away from ourselves and seek God's face and his help. You see, you cannot look into the Lord's face and not be changed. Then he said, we must do something else. He says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. We must turn. That's repentance. That's what true repentance is. We turn away from sin and we turn toward God. That's what repentance is. 
the heart, which has had its hunger satisfied by the sight of God's face, will no longer want to hold on to the things that grieve the Heavenly Father. And so, if we expect things to happen, we who claim to be Christians, we we have some turning to do, don't we? We need to turn back to God. We need to turn away from some of the things of the world that grieve the Heavenly Father. What we need to do really is stop defending our sin and forsake it. Today, if you talk about sin, people have an excuse why they do it. They can find all kinds of reasons. It's peer pressure. The society that I live in, that's just the way that I am. Or the way I see it is different than the way God sees it. They always have an answer for it. But we need to stop defending it, forsake it, and turn back to God. Anything in our lives which keeps us from being the very best Christian is a wicked way in God's sight. And God says we need to turn from our wicked ways. Well, what will this do? Notice what he says here. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin. What will God do? He'll hear us. He said, I will hear from heaven. I'm glad I serve a God who will hear my cries for help. I'm glad that I serve a God who hears when I have a need. I'm glad that I serve a God who will forgive when I confess. I'm glad that we have a God like that. The Bible says that my God shall supply all of your need through Christ Jesus. I'm glad we have a God like that. He will forgive. He will forgive our sins. Every Christian should memorize 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and forgive us or cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just to forgive us. Do you know that verse is written to Christians, not to unsaved? I've heard people use it that way, and it's true. If you confess, God will forgive, but it's written to Christians. Just like here, he says, if we'll turn, if we'll repent, if we'll confess, then he will hear from heaven. The fact is we have a problem. And the fact is God has the answers. And there is no reason why God's people He said, I will hear from heaven. Then I will forgive. Then he said, I will heal their land. Now, again, that's a particular promise to Israel. But I see an application for America today. What makes America great is great Americans. But what makes great Americans is great Christians. As we look around, I mentioned what it was like when I was younger and I wouldn't have ever believed we see America the way it is today. But I also look back and I see what happened. You know what the biggest problem that I see is we as God's children wouldn't take stands when we needed to. We let them by little bit by little bit take away the Christian heritage that we have. We didn't stand for right against abortion the way we should have. I could go on and on with the list of sins in America that we didn't stand for. The problem is we didn't. And so we need to get back to the place where 
you and I are great Christians. That makes great Americans. And that influences other people. Now, to be a great Christian, you first of all have to be a Christian. You must be born again. You must receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. There is no in-between ground. Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. So we must make choices. The first choice is whether I'll receive Christ. The second is, will I be a Christian that brings honor and glory to my Heavenly Father? You and I have to make that decision. I don't think we can blame the unsaved for the way the country is until we first look at ourselves and say, have we done what we should have done? Have we been what we should have been? Are we doing what we should do? Until we look at that and can honestly say, we've done our part, then maybe we can blame the world. But let's start with ourselves. Repentance begins at the house of God. Let's stand for prayer. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, no one looking around. Perhaps God would speak to your heart this morning. Maybe having to do with the fact that I'm not a Christian. I wonder if there's one that would say, Preacher, I've never been born again. I've never been saved. I think God's speaking to my heart about that. I, I, I need to begin with that. Would you please pray for me? Just lift your hand for a moment. I'll pray for you. I'll not embarrass you. I'll not come get you. I'll just lift you up before God. Is there one like that? Then I wonder, I wonder if there's a Christian that would say, hey, it needs to begin with me. Need to start right here. I can't change the whole world till I'm what God wants me to be. I can't take right stands because there's some things in my life that are hindering me. Preacher, would you pray for me? I'm saved, I know it, but I know that there's some problems. Thank you, God bless you, several around the auditorium, thank you. Another? I'm not going to embarrass anyone, I'm not gonna call you, I will pray for you, thank you, God bless you. As God speaks to your heart, if you're not saved, someone will be here to help you and show you from God's word how you can know Jesus Christ as your savior. If you're a Christian and need to apply 1 John 1, 9 or, or some other uh, Bible verse where God's calling you and speaking to your heart, here's an altar, here's a place. Many have already come, but it's your turn. Will you do what God wants you to do? Will you come to him today? Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for those who have asked me to pray for them. I lift them up before you and ask your will be done in their lives. We thank you for each one. Uh, that have already come, a few come and gone, but uh, I believe you're still speaking to some hearts. They've asked me to pray for you, and I pray for each one. I pray for those who are not saved, that they would come receive Christ as Savior. Others who, who are saved would come and be what you want them to be, to lay their life on the altar, to serve you and be faithful. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.